Hello, it's uh, good to be back to share uh, some words with you today. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday, the start of what we call Holy Week. It's a week in which Christians the world over experience a whole spectrum of emotions around Jesus. Triumphant entry into Jerusalem, the communion at the Last Supper, the betrayal by Judas, the desertion of the, the disciples, the kangaroo court, the beating, the crucifixion, the darkness and silence of the grave, and then the joy and light of resurrection. These events, and indeed the whole life and resurrection of Jesus, took place for you. Yes, for you. I want us as we prepare for Easter to be perfectly clear that Jesus was born, lived, died, and rose again for you and for me. Sometimes it's uh, all too easy for us to fall into the error of thinking that Jesus died for others, but surely not little old me. Surely the things that I have done in my life, you might think, are too great to be forgiven by God. The times when I let God down, the times when I sinned, the times when I disobeyed God, the times when I went days, sometimes even weeks, without thinking about God at all, the times when I did not love God with all my heart and soul, and certainly did not love my neighbor as I loved myself. And yet the whole meaning of Easter is that Jesus lived and died and rose again for you and me. So, yes, Easter really is for you. Let's just look. If you feel that in your heart that, you know, you've done things in the past and we've done things in the past that uh, cannot be forgiven, let's just look at two examples. One from the Old Testament and one from a parable of Jesus which highlights the love and forgiveness of God towards us, towards you. I will start with the life of King David. When Jesus entered, when Jesus entered Jerusalem on that donkey, uh, the crowd welcomed him by shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. And yet King David lived 1,000 years or so before Jesus. Yet Israel remembered David as their greatest king, not only for his illustrious achievements, but more for his devotion to God. The writer Philip Yancey draws attention to two incidents in David's life. David was known as a man after God's own heart. But hang on a minute. How can anyone so obviously flawed, he did after all commit adultery and murder, gain such a great relationship with God. How can that be? Well, in one of his first acts as king, David sent the sacred ark to install as a symbol of God's presence in Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant. Jerusalem was the new capital city he was building. And when the ark arrived, it was this great, great celebration with a parade of music with drums, trumpets, cymbals, Choir singing, people singing, shouts from the crowd, which was huge. And what did, they, what did King David do? Well, he totally lost control. Bursting with joy, David danced and cartwheeled in the streets. Can you imagine a king doing that? Dancing and cartwheeling in the streets. Well, the sight of David the king doing somersaults in a scanty robe scandalized his wife until until David put her straight. If you think that's bad, I will become even more undignified than this. I will celebrate, celebrate before the Lord. But David was a man who just didn't believe in God. He believed in God with a passion. He had passion. who felt more passionately about God than anything else in the world. And yet the second scene happens years later at the peak of David's powers. David had just acted out one of the world's oldest plot lines. He, a married man, sees a married woman. 
not his wife, someone else's. Man sleeps with a woman, the woman gets pregnant. And there's nothing unusual there, because you can read about stories in any newspaper. The uh, episode with Bathsheba reveals a different side to David. When his plan to cover up the adultery fails, he turns to a ruthless scheme involving the husband's murder and needless slaughter of many people on a battlefield. A classic case of one crime leading to another ensued as David, the spiritual leader of the nation, broke the sixth, seventh, ninth, and tenth commandments in quick succession. When Bathsheba moved in and married David, it appeared that he had gotten away with the crime. No one raised a word of protest. No one except, that is, the prophet Nathan. Nathan, risking his life, confronts David over his sins. You can look it up in 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's very exciting. David could have had Nathan killed. Or he could have laughed and thrown him out of the palace. He could have issued a string of denials. What evidence could Nathan produce? Would servants testify against their king? Instead, the first words that David utters is, I have sinned against the Lord. And as David had once danced and rejoiced before God, so had David sinned before that same God. David repents. And his relationship with God continues. And years later, when the Assyrian army was about to overwhelm Jerusalem, God worked a miracle of rescue. And says, for my sake and for the sake of my servant David, God tells the Jews that his love for them will never end. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love, promise to David. Yep, David was human like all of us. He had feet of clay. He was self-serving, deceitful, lustful, and vain. But in his heart, he had a passion for God. and God forgave him and loved him, as God loves you and I. Let's look at the second example of the kind of father that we have in God, typ typified in the parable of the lost son. You may, you may remember that Jesus is speaking to large crowds who were traveling with him. You can look it up in Luke 14 from verse 25. Luke then tells us that many in the crowd were tax collectors, sinners. Also, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law. And the Pharisees did not like mixing with such people as sinners, tax collectors, and such. And they would have been outraged that Jesus did. Their outlook was not, there will be joy in the heaven over one sinner who repents, but uh, more along the lines of, there will be joy in heaven on, on one sinner who is obliterated by God. They sound a happy lot. They look forward not to the saving of sinners, but to the destruction of sinners. Jesus knows what's going on, and he speaks to the crowd in parables. And three of those parables are about being lost and found. The parable of lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Not only is it about the lost son, but also the father and the elder son. Well, we, you may well remember, we know that the younger son asked his father for a share of his inheritance. It was a custom in those days that the elder son would get two-thirds of the father's inheritance and the younger son one-third, but only after the father had died. And by asking his father for a share now, before his father's death, the son is actually saying, I can't wait to get my share when you die. I want it now so that I can be independent and get away from here. I want to live away from you and my brother. And the father, although hurt by his younger son's request, gracefully gives his son his share. The son goes off to a foreign land and he spends a lot of his fortune on wild living. He is soon broke 
to the extent that he has to get working feeding pigs. So there he was, broke and almost starving. And then Jesus tells us that the younger son, he repents. When he came to his senses, he says, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. So he got up and traveled back to his father. And so we have a sorrowful son traipsing back to his father. His fortune gone, but not only that, the arrogance and self-confidence that he had displayed when he left his family had been shattered. How would he be received by his father? Would his father have him back, even as a hired hand? Well, he finds out before he enters his father's house. His father had no doubt been worried about his youngest son. He kept a lookout for him day after day. And each day ended in disappointment. His son had not returned home. Until, until one day the father sees someone approaching the house a long, long way away. The father looks, maybe shielding his eyes to focus on the traveler. Could it be, could it possibly be? Yes, it is. It's his lost son returning home. And what does the father do? Even whilst his son is a long way off, he runs, he runs towards his son, and upon reaching him, filled with compassion and love, he throws his arms around him, kisses his son. Ooh. The son starts to say his prepared speech to his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy, worthy to be called your son. And that's as far as he gets. He has no chance to ask to be taken on as a hired hand because his father says to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. Well, in those days, a robe signified honor. A ring signified authority. And sandals were worn by sons, not slaves or hired hands. The younger son is accepted back into the family by his father, and the parable could easily be known as the par parable of the loving father, the loving father who shows forgiveness of God. And sometimes, you know, it's easier to confess to God than it is to another person. God is more merciful in his judgments than many people. God loves us far broader than human love, and God can forgive when we refuse to forgive. The sheep were lost through foolishness, the coin through no fault of its own. The son deliberately went lost, callously turning his back on his father. And towards the end, do you know, towards the end of the American Civil War, a, an officer in the Union Army asked President Abraham Lincoln what he would do with the men in the South who had fought against the North expecting the president to pronounce uh, some form of severe penalty on his southern opponent, opponents, the officer was surprised by Lincoln's reply. I will welcome them back as if they had never been away. And so, by the younger son's repentance, I have sinned, and the father's compassion towards his son, they are reunited. But not everyone is happy. The elder son returns home from working in the field. He hears music and dancing. He asks a servant, what's going on? And the servant gleefully tells the elder son, your brother has come back and your father has killed the fatted calf because he is back safe and sound. Is the uh, elder brother filled with the same joy his father about the return of his brother? No, far from it. He becomes angry and refuses to enter the house. His father hears about this. And so the father has to leave the house a second time that day to receive a son into his home. 
The father pleads for the, with his eldest son. But it's no use. Look, says the eldest son, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property or with prostitutes and other wild living, when he comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father says, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. In his actions, the elder son shows through his anger his self-righteousness. His attitude shows that his years of obedience to his father have been years of grim duty and not loving service. He display, displays an utter lack of sympathy. He refers to the lost son not as his brother, but as this son of yours. So one of the questions the parable raises is this. Are we, the, are we the younger son or the elder son? The younger son had returned home. The elder son needed to come home. The elder son was lost too. Externally, he did all the right things a good son is supposed to do. But internally, in his heart, he'd wandered away from his father. He did his duty worked hard every day and fulfilled all his obligations, but became increasingly unhappy and unfree. He became bitter, resentful, and angry. What happened to the eldest son? Did he eventually let himself be persuaded by his father? Did he finally enter into the house and participate in the celebrations? Did he embrace his brother and welcome him home as this father had done? Did he sit down at the same table and enjoy the festive meal? The parable does not tell us about the eldest son's final willingness to let himself be found. Is the eldest son willing to confess that he too is a sinner in need of forgiveness? Is he willing to admit that he's not better than his brother? Jesus leaves us with these, but these questions. We do not know how the younger son accepted the celebrations, or how he lived with his father after his return. We do not know whether the eldest son ever re reconciled himself with his brother, his father, or himself. What we do know with unwavering certainty is the heart of the father. It is a heart of compassion, love, and limitless, limitless mercy. So the joy at the dramatic return of the younger son in no way means that the elder son was less loved, less appreciated, less favored. The father does not compare the two sons. He loves them both with a complete love according to their individual journeys. He knows them intimately. He understands their high, highly unique gifts and shortcomings. He sees the love, with love, the passion of his younger son, even when it is not regulated by obedience. With the same love, he sees the obedience of the elder son, even when it's not vitalized by passion. With the younger son, there are no thoughts of better or worse, more or less, just as there are no measuring sticks for the elder son. The father responds to both, according to their uniqueness. The return of the younger son makes him call for a joyful celebration. The return of the elder son makes him extend an invitation to fully participation in that joy. So the story of the lost son is a story of a God who goes searching for me and you and who doesn't rest until he has found us. He urges, he pleads, he begs us to stop clinging to the powers of death and to let ourselves be embraced by arms that will carry us to the place where we will find the life we most desire. 
But what are the father? We pay a lot of attention to the sons in the parable. But as Henry Nguyen states, that one of the real questions is, are we, are we ourselves interested in being like the father? It feels somehow good to be able to say, well, those sons are like me. It gives us a sense of being understood. But how does it feel to say, the father is like me? Do we want to be like the father? Do we want to be not the, just the one who is forgiven, but also the one who forgives? Not just the one who is being welcomed home, but also the one who welcomes home. Not just the one who received compassion, but the one who offers it as well. That's one of the challenges which this parable confronts us with. We cannot remain sons. As sons, we grow, we age, we mature. And as we do so, we must become more and more like our Heavenly Father as we journey through our life, showing the Father's love, compassion, grace, and forgiveness in the things that we do and in the relationships that we have. Through this parable, Jesus wants to make it clear to the Pharisees, to the scribes, that the God of whom he is speaking is a God of compassion, who jo with joy welcomes repentant sinners into his home. If God forgives the sinners, then we should too. If God welcomes sinners home, then we should do likewise. The God of whom Jesus speaks about is a God who offers himself as an example and model for all human behavior. Becoming like the Father is the very heart of Jesus' message. When, shortly before his death, Jesus prays to his Father for his disciples, he says, Father, they do not belong to this world any more than I belong to this world. May they all be one, just as the Father, you are in me, and I am in you, so that they may be also be in us, so that the world may believe that it was you who sent me. Once we are in God's house as sons and daughters of his household, we can be like him, love like him, be good like him, care like him. Jesus leaves no doubt about this when he explains, if you love those who love you, what credit can you expect? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit can you expect? Even sinners do that much. If you lend to those whom you hope to get money back, what credit can you expect? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. Instead, love your enemies and do good to them and land without any hope of return. You will have a great reward, and you will be children of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. This is the core message of the Gospel, the way human beings are called to love one another with the same selfless, outgoing love that we see in the Father in the story of the lost son. We must become like the Father and see the world through his, through his eyes. So we remember at this coming Easter time to give thanks to God the Father and Jesus his Son and the Holy Spirit that when Jesus was, re res when Jesus was resurrected, he resurrected you and me. God has forgiven you. Just as he forgave David, just as the, the father forgave his prodigal son. Yes, Easter really is for you and for me. God bless you. And with that, I leave you with a blessing. May the peace of the Lord God go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. 
May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I leave you with a, a song by Hillsong, Hillsong Worship, which reminds us that Jesus is the King of Kings. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt